Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very, very much. And good morning, everybody here. Um, I'm glad to be your first and not your last speaker. Uh, let me tell you about how I came to write this book, which some or many of you already know about. Uh, about five years ago, I came upon a just declassified U.S. government report that said that in the coming uh, few years, crescendoing in 2025, there would be a profound global water shortage. Now, we all have been accustomed to learning about water issues, mostly from the environmental movement for the last 40 or 50 years, thinking about water quality. And we have taken water quantity for granted. But in fact, what this US government report said was that water quantity would become the profound issue of our time. Now, this coming from an not from an environmental group or somebody who had an ax to grind for this, but from an intelligence agency, I was eager to learn more about what this would mean. And so digging deeper into the report and also then going online and interviewing some people, I learned that some of the reasons why this is going to be a problem is because number one, climate change is changing rain patterns everywhere. Number two, population is growing everywhere. And number three, the richer people get, the more economic activity there is, the more water is used. And in fact, over the next just 10 years from where we are today, it's estimated that about 1.3 billion people who are economically deprived, who live in squalor today, will rise out of squalor into the bottom rungs of what is called economically the middle class. That means they will have homes that have running water. That means they will have electricity. That means they will change their diets. And some, just to give an example of this, a pound of corn versus a pound of beef. The pound of beef requires 17 times more water to grow. So if 1.2, 1.3 billion people are going to be rising out of poverty, changing their diets, changing their lifestyles, we're going to be needing a great deal more water. So I, I, after reading this report, I began, probably like many people in this audience, to become gravely concerned about not just what this is going to mean for the world, but what this is going to mean for Israel. Now, like many of you, I've been to Israel many times. And perhaps you knew more than I knew, but all I knew about Israel was that it's a very dry place. I came to learn that about 60% of Israel is desert. I came to learn that the rest of the country is semi-arid. I came to learn that although Israel never had a robust amount of rainfall in the last just couple of decades because of climate change, Israel's average annual rainfall has dropped by 25%. And this has happened in the same time period that Israel's population has led the world in population growth, a tenfold increase, and that Israel's economic activity has been among the top three countries in the world, with Singapore and South Korea, with a 70-fold increase in GDP, which is a measurement of a country's national wealth. So I'm thinking to myself, very dry country, mostly desert, climate change problems, fast-growing population, economic activity, all the measurements of what generally causes a water crisis, and I thought to myself, Israel is going to have a mega crisis, and what can I do to help? But as I started reading around, and looking around, and seeing what it is that could be done, you could have actually knocked me over with a feather. I became startled to learn that not only didn't Israel have a water problem, not only wasn't Israel merely self-sufficient in water, but that Israel is truly abundant in water. This in the world's driest region, this in a place where every one of its neighbors has profound water problems morphing into water crises. And so I said to myself, I need to understand how this is possible. Because if it is true that the world is going into a water crisis that has begun around now, five years ago, and is going to grow ex exceedingly worse by the year 2025, wouldn't it be interesting to see if Israel is the solution? And my friends here, I want to say to you, for those of us who care about Israel and care about Israel's good name, this is a transformational moment. This is a pivotal moment. And why is that the case? This is a transformational moment because at the very moment that the world is going into a drying pattern, and we see this now, this report is correct, Droughts all over the world. Eight U.S. states are now in drought. Eastern and Central Europe in drought. 
Southeast Asia in severe drought. China and India now announcing shortages of water that may require uprooting of tens of millions of people from where they live to where they need to be moved. An amazing humanitarian challenge ahead of us that can be headed off with one smart approach, and that is how can the world be more like Israel? And so I want you to know that what I decided to do at first was not to write a book. I decided at first just to try to share the story with others. And I learned to my somewhat amazement that public officials that I knew knew very little about this. That even though this was a US government report, just about none of the public officials I spoke to were even aware of the fact that it had been studied. And so I said to myself, if this is true that right now we hear all kinds of bad things about Israel, how wonderful it would be to change the conversation and to give people a new reason and a new way to think about Israel. And so I want you to know, I sit out and I write the book, and the truth of the matter is I had no expectation that the book would end up on any bestseller list, let alone the New York Times and the LA Times. The publisher initially told me that they would print about 1,500 copies, and that if it did really super well, they'd print another 2,500, and that would basically be the game. That's how books are done these days. So now we are about eight months out. There are about 50,000 books out. And it doesn't stop there. Because this is not just a US story, this is a global story. And as of this morning, countries, which frankly, some of which I couldn't find on a map, are now reaching out to me, asking me if local publishers in these countries have reached out to me to ask me, could they produce translated versions of my book for sale in their countries. So now we have some 12 different foreign language editions already. At the trajectory we're at, it's projected that it'll be as many as 30 different foreign languages will be told that all over the world. And as Jessica kindly mentioned in the intro, every single penny of royalties that I'm receiving is being donated to Israeli charities. So it's even further. It's an even further virtuous good for p things that we all care about and places that we love. So here's what I want to leave you with as the best of all of the news that I've learned from this. You want to know what inspires me right now? I want to tell you what inspires me right now. Israel has inspired me since I was a young graduate student and I wandered into Israel by accident my first time. I, don't grow, I didn't grow up in a Zionistic household. I didn't grow up in a household that thought about Israel very often. But ever since I've been a graduate student many years ago in Israel, it changed my perception and I've been inspired by the country. But I want to share with you something that many of you will be surprised to learn. Jessica also mentioned that I've been traveling aggressively all over the country. I've received now over 450 speaking invitations. I've accepted over 200 of them. 20 of them were at colleges, many of them elite schools. Now, of course, you know, going and telling a pro-Israel story on campus, obviously, it's going to be bad news, right? But here's what the good news is. Whether it's Harvard or Yale or MIT or Princeton or Brown or Stanford or University of Texas, or the LBJ School of Public Policy, wherever I have gone, it has been the exact opposite of what you would have thought. Rather than people saying, oh my God, it's a pro-Israel story, what can we do to undermine that? What I have discovered is, to my amazement and to my joy, is that, no, no reason for tears, no reason to cry. <laughs> Obviously, obviously a bds -er in the audience here. They get them very young these days. <laughs> They're very nefarious how young they recruit them. <laughs> but what I have discovered to my amazement and to my joy is the following. If you could imagine a pie chart, the people on campus who are passionately pro-Israel, maybe 5%. The people who are passionately anti-Israel on campus, maybe 2%. Vocal, but 2%. And the up for grabs part of that campus, 93%. And when we present them with a positive, forward-looking story about Israel, they spark to it. I have large audiences at all these college campuses, and the audiences are filled with students from Asia, from Africa, from the US, of course. These are not Jewish students. These are not Hillel meetings. And they come, and they stay, and they want to know what they can do to learn from the Israel example that they can bring back to their countries. And this is what should inspire us all. Yes, we have antagonists. Of course we do. But also, what you need to know is 
that we have many friends, and more importantly, we have many, many potential friends. When we tell a positive story, when we tell a story that inspires, when we tell a story that says what Israel can do for others rather than asking what others can do for Israel, people stand up, people sit up, people pay attention, and people want to have a new friend. I thank you all, new friends and old friends, very good. Thank you. Bye-bye.